Vishnu Padaya and so on, uh, we are acknowledging this very important focus of his mission. Uh, it translated, you are kindly preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya Deva and delivering the Western countries which are filled with impersonalism and voidism. And we can see from reading the Chaitanya Chari Charmita that even in Lord Chaitanya's time, devotees had to constantly fight against this mentality in themselves and in the minds of those around them. So why is that? Because this is the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. And even as aspiring devotees, we are influenced by the tendency to quarrel for any slightest reason and to be hypocritical. It's in the air we breathe, similar to the coronavirus. This impersonalism and void, voidism mentality is all around us. Um, spiritual bypassing is particularly prevalent among Westerners practicing or thinking they are practicing an Eastern religious path because they graft their impersonal mentality over Eastern philosophy. I've noticed that Western uh, devotees can mix their fundamentalist Christian notions of spirituality also onto the bhakti path without realizing what they're doing. And all of us are subject to these kinds of misconceptions because we are mixed devotees. And that means we are still conditioned by our old habits and ways of thinking. Most of us are still materialistic devotees without even acknowledging this about ourselves. Many of us have the tendency to say things like, oh, well, you're not your body when someone is sick or their body is in pain. And while it may be true that we are eternal spiritual beings living within a temporary physical body, it doesn't mean we don't feel physical and emotional pain. Um, we are Krishna's marginal energy. And so uh, even though we are on the spiritual platform, we have feelings of separation and ecstasy in separation and meeting Krishna and his devotees. And bhakti yoga is all about connecting with God through our feelings. Um, sometimes we have uh, this idea in the Western philosophy that acknowledges the, the truth that I've just expressed there by calling it tangential, that the soul is tangential or um, the human condition is that we have one foot in the material world and one foot in the spiritual world. Uh, we live somewhere in between or something we call liminal space. So in Vaishnava theology, it's, it's we're marginal energy. Uh, so rather than dismissing or devaluing our body as something not important, it is the temple uh, that encases our soul. So I prefer to think of myself as essentially more than my body rather than I am not my body because when my body is ill or it feels pain, it definitely affects my ability to absorb my thoughts in Krishna despite my acknowledgement that I am eternally a spiritual being. So when my pinky hurts or my toe hurts, it totally makes it hard for me to concentrate. If I have a, a strong pain, even at the, at the end of my, my finger, it's, uh, it's hard to focus because it's affecting me. So as a person pursuing spiritual life, we might say we are spiritual beings having a human experience. Uh, from a materialistic person's view, we might think of ourselves as a human being having a spiritual experience. And in this way, we can be reminded that we are beings who are eternally full of wisdom and joy as spiritual beings, although we're living in a material body. Still, until we have attained such ecstatic love for Krishna that we completely forget our body altogether, then to imitate such a level of consciousness is what behavioral scientists call this spiritual bypassing. And in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, it's pretty much the same uh, uh, as we our understanding of sahajism. Uh, someone who's pretending to be more than they're more than they are, really more than they realize. There's this great pastime um, 
uh, when Hari Keshwami was Prabhupada's servant in Vrindavan. And there was a person visiting the temple who was rolling on the floor of the temple crying for Krishna. And Prabhupada instructed Harikesh to go down to the temple and whack the man with his cane. And after much hesitation, Harikesh finally did what Prabhupada had asked him to do. He gave the man a whack with Prabhupada's cane. And then the man immediately got up off the floor and in great anger, he started shouting at Harikesh Swami. So Prabhupada wanted to prove the point that if a person was truly absorbed in ecstatic love for Krishna, they wouldn't even notice that someone beat them, what to speak of feeling any pain. So this man who Harikesh whacked with Prabhupada's cane was clearly a pretender or a sahajiya. Prabhupada used to point to Haridas Thakur also as an example of a truly absorbed lover of God because although he was beaten in 24 marketplaces, um, he didn't even really feel that pain at all. I mean, at, at one point they even threw him in a river and he didn't even notice it. And he didn't even uh, blame the people who beat him. He felt compassion for those persons who had beaten him. Um, and Prabhupada said that even he himself, Prabhupada could not imitate Haridas Thakur's level of ex ecstasy. So what to speak of us? We have a long way to go. So people practicing religion often use spiritual philosophies and practices to numb their pain rather than as a means of purifying their hearts and consciousness and developing unconditional love for Krishna in their current circumstances. It's quite common to see a person who is addicted to drugs or is an alcoholic who goes through the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program. And that's a very effective program, by the way. And, but, but suddenly they get God. And then God becomes their means of numbing their unprocessed emotional pain. God becomes their new drug. And they bypass or jump over doing the difficult work of self-examination and taking responsibility for their own behavior and feelings. As a grief specialist, I have learned that when we are talking about emotional pain, we're really talking about having grief over something we have lost. Life is so full of losses because it is always changing and it can sometimes be difficult to accept some of those sudden changes. Loss of a loved one, loss of a job, loss of our health, loss of a limb, loss of our faith or trust in a person or even a religious leader or a movement. That's all grief. Uh, that follows such losses. And it may be that instead of pausing to acknowledge our emotional pain, we try to avoid it by numbing it or drowning it out through our spiritual practice. And yes, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra is the only means of healing our pain. But we can also use chanting to avoid our pain if we are more focused on getting high than crying for Krishna, who is the goal of our chanting to cry like a child crying for their mother. So God becomes a kind of drug that can enable us to escape from our pain for a while, or it can be a means of trying to enjoy Krishna or trying to get what we want rather than to seek what God wants or Krishna wants for us. Of course, we know that it is ultimately true that loving and serving Krishna is the solution to all our earthly problems. And we do feel joy and love when we chant the holy name by ourselves or with other people. But becoming permanently situated in an ongoing sense of God's abiding love in our life is a gradual process. And that requires an ongoing endeavor to purify our minds and hearts through hearing, chanting, and serving the Lord's mission. And when Krishna is satisfied with our sincere love and devotion, he alone will grace us with the ability to transcend our material suffering. Now, as I've become more aware of my own devotional process and inner dynamics, I have realized that if I don't do the important work of identifying and exploring my emotional pain, those unprocessed issues become anartas that become weeds that grow alongside my devotional creeper. And then they get watered along with my devotional creeper while I'm chanting. So this means we can chant and chant and chant the Hare Krishna mantra, but if we haven't uncovered 
acknowledged and pulled out those weeds of unresolved emotional pain, particularly when we are chanting offensively, then those weeds will continue to grow alongside our creeper. And by the way, Prabhupada said it takes about 30 to 40 years to chant offenselessly. So it's a healthy practice to honestly and self-critically look at our mentality in terms of how well we are avoiding the 10 offenses and chanting the holy name in order for us to get a sense for where we are in our spiritual progress. In my experience, uh, it's, it can be that our unacknowledged and unresolved emotional pain combined with our offensive chanting can lead us to stop chanting altogether or even to leave the bhakti path or the association of devotees. It happens all the time. So what does this spiritual bypassing look like? Um, we can witness this spiritual bypassing behavior, particularly when we see someone who appears to be seriously practicing bhakti yoga or any other spiritual path for, for that matter. And suddenly they will explode with anger without any provocation uh, because underneath all of their unintegrated and unrealized spiritual practices, they are carrying a whole lot of unprocessed emotional pain. In my experience, the pain most people carry is grief or trauma related, which also has grief attached to it. Much of it is left over from a person's childhood, from being uncared for or neglected or abused physically or emotionally. So unexpressed grief is like a person's holding underwater a beach ball in each hand that keeps trying to pop up out of the water. And it takes all a person's energy to hold those balls down until the balls may seem to be very lightweight. If you try to hold them under the water, they will create a pressure due to the air inside the ball wanting to come to the surface. And even if a person stays focused on pressing those balls down to keep them submerged, the balls will eventually pop out of the water because you can only focus on holding beach balls underwater for so long. It takes a lot of work to keep them submerged. So in the same way, our unreconciled or unprocessed emotional pain or grief takes an enormous amount of subtle energy to keep them submerged in our subconscious mind and then our unconscious mind is always working hard to keep those painful emotions submerged like those beach balls but because because we can only keep our unacknowledged and unprocessed emotions submerged for so long they eventually erupt to the surface and compel us to behave in ways that are hurtful to others and to ourselves. And it can ruin our material and our spiritual lives. So spiritual bypassing is a shadow of spirituality, not only for Hare Krishna devotees, but for people practicing all major religious traditions. We have seen this pattern again and again in ISKCON where a spiritual leader, teacher, guru who has was esteemed as a pure devotee or a realized soul suddenly runs off with a female disciple or steals money or does something completely against their own ideals and the ideals of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. And after something like that happens, the person themselves and the people who witnessed their behavior, they're shocked and shaken because they cannot believe that anyone who is so spiritually advanced could behave that way. So what's going on here is that what, while a person might be so-called spiritually advanced, they may also be emotionally immature or still a child inside who never got their basic need for love and belonging met, possibly from their parents or their early life caregivers. And that is probably true for most of us because in this age of quality, uh, this is the age of quarrel and hypocrisy. Many of us had parents and relatives who were unable to provide us with authentic love as described by psychologist David Rico. Uh, he calls them the five A's, which are attention, acceptance, appreciation, affection, and allowing, or the freedom to choose. And when we have not received sufficient attention, acceptance, appreciation, affection, and allowing in our early life, we're very likely to look towards our friends, our spouses, religious leaders, teachers, a therapist, or even a religious organization to satisfy these needs for love and belonging. And when we don't get these needs for love and belonging met and care, we become disappointed. And then we feel like we've been betrayed. And although we might be expert at describing bhakti as unconditional love, uh, 
as what we do as Vaishnavas, we often don't seem to have a clear idea what love looks like or even feels like. So David Rico's a description of love as an action rather than a feeling offers a very clear definition of authentic love, particularly when, think, when we think about how to engage in loving exchanges between ourselves and devotees. So spiritual bypassing is not much different than using any other means of avoiding or escaping from our emotional pain, like food or computer games or sex or intoxication or gambling. There's so many ways that we can avoid facing our feelings in the moment. And feelings are information, so they have something to tell us. Uh, this kind of avoidant behavior is what keeps us on the surface of the devotional process. Even though we might engage in some devotional practices, we end up remaining what Vaishnava scriptures call a materialistic devotee, a Kanishta Adhikari, or a neophyte. And then we aren't prepared or perhaps even capable of doing the deep work of being brutally honest with ourselves regarding our relationship with Krishna and other living beings. So authentic spirituality will not take root in us until we outgrow this tendency to avoid our emotional pain. And this means that instead of turning away from our emotional pain, we need to rather go inwards and explore what is coming up for us when we feel our emotions. We need to be curious rather than judgmental or shameful about our pain and use what is coming up for us as a means of becoming more aware of ourselves as fragile, imperfect, limited beings and then cry to Krishna to give us the taste and the strength to serve him in spite of ourselves. While it may be that when we love and serve Krishna, our karmic reactions begin to slacken and stop, it may also, uh, it may also experience at certain points in our devotional lives a deep feeling of separation from Krishna that Christians would describe as a dark night of the soul. Uh, in bhakti, we might describe this experience as vipralamba, a deep feeling of separation from Krishna, which is considered to be a symptom of ecstatic love. Another symptom of ecstatic love for Krishna is when we feel deeply connected in love with Krishna. So as we advance, we will sometimes feel deeply connected in love with Krishna, and sometimes we may feel lamentation or a deep sense of grief because we feel separated from Krishna or that he's absent in our lives. Uh, such spiritual sentiments can feel like depression also, but it is, it's, in its purified form, it is transcendental grief. So we may experience a time when we have no taste to chant the holy name, or render service, or even to associate with other devotees, or we may feel ourselves completely lost living in this world, like we don't belong here. We might even feel disgusted, which is one of the six primary emotions. In uh, my early days as a devotee, I was sent from Germany to Vrindavan to assist the wife of our then GBC. And a few months later, he took sannyas in Mayapur, although she had not given him her con consent. Before the Mayapur festival, her husband had gone to Prabhupada begging him to give him sannyas. And Prabhupada said, only with your wife's consent. So Prabhupada called her into his room and asked if she would give him her consent. And she said, I don't agree that he should take sannyas, but if he does take sannyas, I will accept it. What else can I do? So after Prabhupada gave her husband, uh, gave her husband sannyas in Mayapur and returned to Vrindavan, where I was staying with her, Prabhupada called her to his room to see how she was doing after her husband took sannyas. And she said to Prabhupada, now that my husband has taken sannyas, I hate everyone and everything in this material world. And Prabhupada nodded and said, yes, now you are making spiritual advancement. So these are all different types of moods we may experience in our spiritual journey. And a healthy spirituality acknowledges that despite all the pain we might be going through, Krishna is always with us. We are never alone, and this will be the last time we suffer because we st if we stay the course, if we stay on this path, and in good times and bad times and high times and low times, we turn to Krishna, we will eventually fall in love with Krishna in truth and return to be with him eternally. Krishna promises this in Bhagavad Gita, that my devotee, that he will never perish. Prabhupada used the image of a fan 
saying that when you unplug a fan, it will continue rotating for a while until it eventually stops. So Krishna consciousness is like that. It may take some time for our karmic reactions to slow down and be eradicated. And even a pure devotee suffers the threefold miseries of material life, adhyatmika, adhidaivika, and adibodhika. And they also experience old age, disease, and finally death. But the difference between us, the conditioned soul, and a realized soul is that the realized soul sees things as they are. They aren't bewildered by the modes and they keep serving Krishna however they feel on the material platform. Because they're so absorbed in single-pointedly serving Krishna, they don't notice their suffering. Prabhupada used to say, when I stop preaching, then I suffer. So he never missed an opportunity to speak about Krishna because when he vibrated transcendental sound, his pain stopped. Prabhupada used to say, sometimes we are swimming, sometimes we are floating, sometimes we are drowning in the ocean of material existence. So this is a situation for all of us. I've heard relatively new devotees say to me that they're glad they have found Krishna consciousness because now they will be happy forever. They will stay high forever. But in my experience, the more we chant Hare Krishna, the more the dirty things in our heart begin to surface. And sometimes it doesn't feel so happy all the time. Just like if you take a long stick and dig around on the bottom of a well, a bunch of mud and leaves and perhaps even a shoe will float to the top. The same thing happens when we are engaged in the devotional process of cleansing our hearts. Out of nowhere, all kinds of inappropriate or foreign thoughts and feelings, they may come to the surface. And we wonder where they came from. We might even feel guilty about them. So we need to lean in towards our spiritual pain and do our psychological work so we can enter into the depths of what the ancient teachers in the Vedic literatures were talking about. What are some of the typical signs of a person who is spiritual bypassing? Well, a person's lack of grounding and in the body experience or, or the name of their, the name of their uh, not being their body or in the name of their not being their body, they describe their spiritual spiritual experience in ethereal ways, which it, in behavioral science is, is called magical thinking. For example, recently I spoke to a woman who had just discovered Krishna consciousness and absolutely loved reading parts of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. And she said when she chants, she has the out, an out-of-body experience where she completely forgets her body and enters into some other space where she sees crystalline beings flying around her. She explained that she fasted most of the time except for pureed food and liquids and tea or soup because solid food was too heavy. And sounds like to me might, might be a, a little bit of an air disorder. Maybe not. She told me that this only happened when she chanted and that she only chanted when she felt like it, not in a regulated way. Still, she expressed being completely in love with Krishna. So it may be that her experience was a real one. There's no way I can tell that. Maybe she did see crystalline beings flying around. This might be what it feels like to be in the Brahma Jyoti or what it feels like to be blinded by Krishna's effulgence. But we can understand from scripture that in the spiritual world, the spirit soul is singing the glories of Krishna all the time, eternally, not just when they feel like, all the time. So in order to develop our spiritual body to be able to enter into Krishna's completely spiritual abode, we have to practice chanting a minimum of 16 rounds a day. Actually, we're supposed to be chanting the holy name all the time without stopping. 16 rounds is a minimum. Like Haridas Thakur, who never finished his rounds because he was so absorbed in love for God. Um, even in Orthodox Christianity, their goal is to pray without ceasing. So they practice chanting something called the Jesus Prayer for long periods of time. And they, interestingly enough, have similar spiritual experiences as Gaudiya Vaishnava saints have in our, our described uh, literature. The Jesus Prayer, is, it goes like this. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. So they chant this prayer on beads over and over as a way to pray without ceasing. So this idea that we can practice Krishna consciousness whimsically and call that unconditional love is another form of spiritual bypassing. Another sign of spiritual bypassing is a person's misinterpretation of oneness as being without diversity. They don't understand that everything is simultaneously one and different.
different, that there can be unity in diversity. Oneness just means united in love. Meanwhile, we are each individuals. So the implication of this is that if we are speaking with someone who doesn't acknowledge everyone's unique individuality and cannot honor people being different, thinking that we should all think, do, and act the same, this is spiritual bypassing. It is also impersonalism because each of us has unique and personal relationships with Krishna. And what is good for me might not be good for someone else at the one particular moment. Some typical things people say who are spiritual bypassing are, oh, don't take it personally, it's just your ego. Whatever bothers you about someone is just about you. When a person is experiencing physical or emotional pain, or this too shall pass, it's all just an illusion. People using these phrases typically use them in the wrong context and at the wrong time. While they might be theoretically true, it is insensitive to say something like that to those who are experiencing emotional pain. For example, someone might be expressing being in a difficult situation and a person who is spiritual bypassing will say something like, well, it's just your ego, don't worry about that. So how does saying something like that provide them comfort or help them in any way? It's impersonal. These kinds of comments may be useful in the right context, but not if they are not used appropriately. And we can decide what is the appropriate thing to say and do by identifying what our role is in the relationship, what our goal is in the relationship, and the context of that relationship. So if we use such comments insensitively, then we are out of sync with others and out of sync with ourselves. Using such cliches will distance ourselves from another's pain and our own and create disconnection rather than connection. Another typical inappropriate spiritual bypassing response is to say to a suffering person that they have created their own suffering without considering that the other person who uh, caused them suffering might have an agent uh, have been an agent who contributed to their suffering. For example, if a girl gets raped, a person might say, oh, that's just their karma. What an insensitive comment that is. We would say that's victim blaming. People may say, well, she created that situation, or I wonder what she was trying to teach herself by choosing to be raped. This kind of response is insensitive and disembodied metaphysics. It's purely spiritual bypassing and impersonalism. You could also look at some of these new age notions in reverse. For example, what was the rapist trying to learn by raping the girl? It was just his karma, so does it make his actions all right? This is a toxic and unhealthy way to think about karma, particularly if you are acting in the role of a compassionate care provider, which is something that we're trying to nurture in our Karuna Care students. Because it completely misunderstands spirituality whether it's Eastern or Western. Uh, spirituality is not so black and white and karma theory is not so black and white because there are truly evil people in the world. Uh, Dr. Peck realized after providing psychotherapy for about 30 years that some of his patients were so out of touch with their feelings and reality that they felt absolutely no guilt when they deliberately hurt someone. And there are psychopaths and sociopaths who are so wounded that the they take pleasure in hurting someone else. Some people he uh, consider to be evil because they have given themselves over so completely to the mode of ignorance that they are completely under the spell of ignorance. Examples in the Srimad Bhagavatam are personalities like Kamsa and Ravana and Duryodhana. They were completely determined to kill Krishna and right from the time they were born they were conditioned towards life-destroying actions. We know from the Srimad Bhagavatam that when Duryodhana was born, there were so many inauspicious signs and a voice from the sky urged his parents to kill him immediately because he was destined to, to destroy the entire dynasty. But due to their material attachment, they couldn't do it. And there are such persons in this world called Nichabadas or eternally conditioned souls. They are here in the material world as instruments of the material world, like props on a stage. So it is important as we work with various people to recognize there might be persons who we are unable to help and acknowledge our limitations in that regard. Another spiritual bypassing behavior is when we view karma as something that is black and white or tip for tat and, and can then fall prey to premature forgiveness, emotional dissociation, and we can confuse anger with aggression. 
For example, anger is a real emotion and anger itself can be healthy. But when we turn it outward and towards whatever we think is causing our anger with the intent to retaliate or hurt others, then it turns to aggression and that is not healthy. So when we flippantly say that something is someone's karma, that is dissociation. Karma is actually more complex than that. It is so intricate, we cannot know exactly why a person is experiencing something. It is between them and Krishna. It is very personal and it's none of our business actually. Spiritual bypassing can appear as exaggerated gentleness, niceness, and superficiality. It can also be like a spiritual game of one-upmanship. I'm more humble than you are, or I'm a better listener than you are, or I'm more caring than you are. Or if a person comes to, to us seeking an answer to their temporary material problems and we move to the big picture of what is called globalization as an answer to their question, that is also spiritual bypassing because we are avoiding helping them deal directly with their personal problem and interpersonal pain. It is also a way for us to avoid feeling uncomfortable in the presence of a person's emotional pain pain and doubts. So by spiritual bypassing, it helps us move away from them by distancing ourselves from our personal connection with them. The part of the problem with modern day people trying to practice an ancient culture is that today the culture is a fast food, get it now culture. People are used to not having to work for things. They are used to instant gratification. So when a person begins to practice a spiritual path, they might be uh, they might uh, be able to let everything go in the beginning and feel a sense of bliss, but their emotional issues will resurface and give them problems unless they express it and explore it. So we need to be aware that our spirituality is very much enmeshed with this fast food, get it now culture. We want to get everything handed to us on a plate without working for it, thinking just touch me on the head and make me enlightened because I'm too lazy to do the hard work it takes to get there. You, dear master, do all the work so I don't have to. I just want to escape from suffering. Please solve all my problems for me. The Vaishnava philosophy calls this attitude the desire for liberation because after becoming frustrated from trying to enjoy ourselves, we become disgusted with life. So then we try to find pleasure by renouncing life or striving for liberation. It's another attempt to enjoy spiritual life. So authentic spirituality does not require a person to change the material circumstance. It's about changing their level of awareness from being me-centered to God and other-centered. Another symptom of a person who is spiritual bypassing is someone who uses God talk instead of taking ownership for what they are feeling in the moment or their actions. They tend to use spiritual phrases and platitudes to defend against their feelings. Spiritual bypassing is no different from using any other strategy to defend ourselves against our emotions. We are just using God talk to avoid our emotions rather than something like food or drugs or sex or rock and roll or whatever it is that people use uh, to avoid themselves. For example, someone might say to a person who just lost a loved one, you know, you create your own reality. And this is telling a person they shouldn't feel what they feel. You're not being supportive. Just suck it up. Don't be, a, don't be a pain. You brought this on yourself. Basically, spiritual bypassing is using language that denies a person their feeling. So as compassionate care uh, providers and Vaishnavas who uh, we want to care because that's a spiritual practice for us, all this information is helpful regarding what attitude not to have and what things not to say if you want to create a heart connecting relationship with another person. Something we all want and need in our lives for our spiritual progress and for um, healing our broken places. So I'm going to stop here and um, invite any insights or reflections or questions that anybody might have. Let's see if there's something people like to say, talk about. Hare Krishna, dear um, Ramboru Prabhu, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Many of the ladies are really appreciating it and they really want to follow up. <laughs> That's a so, big topic. Yeah, definitely. Um, so the one lady asks, she says, it feels to me like sometimes some devotees expect that practicing Krishna consciousness 
means we develop some mystical potency to evade Krishna's laws. For instance, the current pandemic is a difficult situation for the whole world, and many people react to it with denial. People in general come up with many complicated rationalizations to express their denial. And in particular, devotees incorporate decontextualized bits of philosophy or devotional history. Would this be an example of spiritual bypassing? If we encounter spiritual bypassing, what is an effective way to address the underlying issue rather than getting entangled in the complicated rationalizations? Oh gosh, everybody will do this differently, you know, and, and uh, to give you my answer probably won't solve your, uh, you know, connection with whoever is doing that. But my rule of thumb, uh, because when I'm in a hospital or I'm in front of somebody who's just experiencing a crisis, um, they're asking the question, why? Everybody tries to make meaning of what's happening to them right now, especially if you're suffering. And so, because life is so mysterious, you know, we don't have the big picture. Only God has the big picture of what really is going on and why it's happening. And so, uh, that's not the appropriate question to address, is why is this happening? The, the appropriate question to ask yourself, after you have had a crisis or after something has happened like COVID, is what now? Okay, this has happened. So, whether it's karma, I mean, how are you going to now try to assign meaning that you have no real entrance in as a perspective? I mean, only Krishna knows all the pieces and, and super soul is aware of what's going on in everybody's hearts and minds. But whether you have a, a, an explanation or not, it doesn't give you insight on how to move forward. So you can't change the past anyway. You know, things happen. Only in the present moment can you move forward beyond and... and um, and that's the question, what now? So I don't know what you say to people. People have all kinds of speculations on Facebook and whatever the, you know, why this is happening. And, you know, maybe some astrological insight and all of that. But the question for each of us, you might say, even as a movement or as an individual, is, okay, what do we do now? This has happened. I've lost my job. I've lost my health. I've lost my loved one. Okay. And that's sad. And I, I, I feel pain that you are going through that. And what now? That's the question. And that's the only productive question we can ask ourselves, whether you believe in karma theory or not. Some people believe in genetics and astrology and whatever the question, it doesn't really matter why it happened. The question is what now? That's my way to deal with it. Thank you so much. Um, so Pooja Singh asks this question, as an aspiring Vaishnava, perhaps it is easier to take stock of the emotions of another person and respond to them with compassion if we remind ourselves to see them as a suffering soul too, with Krishna within them. But it is perhaps often harder to look at ourselves with compassion. So the first question is, how can we be more compassionate and kinder to ourselves? And secondly, Sometimes our emotional baggage or trauma may be so deep and subtle that we may not even realize that it is an issue that we need to address. How can we be more cognizant of the emotional issues that we need to address? Okay, the first question, uh, that was a long second one, so I'm, I'm almost forgetting the first one. The first question was, okay. how, say that again. How can we be more compassionate and kinder to ourselves? Well, recognizing who you are, uh, you know, as a perfect, pure spiritual being that's part of the, the supreme being. You know, we are part and parcel of a God who loves us unconditionally. He created each of us in his image in some way that we have the capacity to, to love and, and be angry and be sad. Everything about us is a reflection of Krishna's perfect uh, personality. And Although we're limited, we are definitely made in God's image in some sort of way. And our bodies don't even belong to us. He's created it in such a perfect way that it's exactly what we need in order to grow towards our love and relationship with him. Um, so it, it can be helpful to remember who we are and whose we are in order to have compassion on ourselves. Another thing that's helpful to me is, is uh, remembering or reminding myself why I, why I have this material body. You know, um, nobody gets in this material world 
who has, uh, unless they're, I guess, an avatar or someone who has come like Prabhupada to save the fallen souls. We all have manifested these material bodies because we wanted to be competitors of Krishna. We decided we didn't want to love Krishna. We fell out of relationship with Krishna and we wanted to pretend we were the controllers and enjoyers. So, you know, Krishna made this little playground for us to do all of that uh, with the one side effect is that we have to suffer when we do that you know okay there are consequences for that and so uh, something about taking ownership of who we are and being honest and humble with ourselves and acknowledging yeah i'm i'm limited i'm faulty i'm fragile i'm a human being and i also have gifts i have limitations but i have gifts too and um and and being compassionate on yourself because we are like everybody else. Everybody has some strengths and limitations. So we also do. And that's being human, you know? So that's helpful. The other one is how can we, well, something about, uh, you know, we may have baggage and, and trauma that we don't even know about. Isn't that what you said? How do you? Yes, yes, we all have baggage and trauma and issues that we need to address. So how can we become cognizant of the emotional issues that we need to address? Well, everybody probably does this differently and everybody does it in their own time. Sometimes we're not ready to see ourselves as Krishna sees us or as, as others see us. I mean, you have three, you have three or four different perspectives. You have Krishna's view of us. You have the view other people see of us. We often notice uh, imperfections and fallibilities of others that we don't, you know, we don't know. They don't know we see and they see the same in us. Um, but um, I would say being intentional to seek out uh, what your blind spots are. Uh, there are various ways to do it. One of the ways I do it is to listen very carefully when people are offering me criticism. It's the hardest thing to do because we hate to hear what we didn't do. You know, we hate that feedback. And we, we end up blaming and pushing away people who are offering us perhaps even in, in care. Sometimes people, you know, feel the need and where is that coming from, that need? Krishna is inspiring from within their heart to say something to you that might be a critique. And maybe it's a suggestion. Maybe it's a criticism. Maybe they deliver it in a really mean-spirited way. But nevertheless, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, um, not a blade of grass moves without the sanction of the Supreme. So somehow Krishna allowed them to say that. Why? Why did I have to hear that? Well, there might be a nugget of truth, you know, as you lick your wounds, you know, you're feeling you're broken hearted that someone um, didn't, didn't say something very friendly or nice. You might be able to wade through and sit with that a minute and see if there might be one thing um, that I can name that has invited that kind of feedback. Mm. So that's, that's a really important important and very, very difficult practice. And I think that, you know, it's not easy for people to do. And I think it takes an enormous amount of spiritual maturity to be able to, to be open to receiving painful feedback and welcome it as a, a way of, of exploring ourselves. After all, Lord Chaitanya said, you know, um, uh, you know, he's, I open my ears when I have criticism and I close them when people flatter me. And that's a hard thing to do. But it does, it does help you grow. Uh, and uh, if you have found that you're triggered, that's another thing. Sometimes we have deep pain from childhood that we've forgotten. We have chosen to suppress or something. Uh, and we notice that we get overwhelmed when, when some piece of information comes up within us or from others. We might want to maybe seek some kind of counseling. You know, let me, let's, let's work on this. You know, why do I get so upset when someone doesn't agree with me? Or why do I get, you know, I get totally depressed if I think someone doesn't like me? You know, that's a question to ask yourself. And it may mean you want to work on it with somebody else in a safe environment, somebody who has the skill to explore that with you. Thank you so much for that wonderful answer. Um, if you don't mind me asking, I would like to know what is the difference between perhaps this and then viewing things as our, our karma? Because you said to tell something like to vic victim blame or to say that this particular situation is happening due to your karma. How is that different to 
if we're, um, you know, taking criticism and saying, you know, there must be truth in it and it's my fault. Well, uh, the difference is, is who's saying it and who's thinking it. If I say, if I now start talking about someone else who I can't possibly know the entire story, life story and circumstances around their pain, and I start, you know, uh, saying things flippantly like, oh, come on, it probably it's your karma. You must deserve it. And say the, that is that is really arrogant and that's very insensitive and very impersonal. I might say that about myself. I have that freedom to say, yeah, gosh, this is really my karma and beat my breast and even be able to tell myself or even tell you, yeah, I know exactly why that has happened to me because I have not been compassionate on other people. And now Krishna is making me experience what they experience. But if I say that about another person, that's inappropriate. So uh, that's all I'm saying is that uh, sometimes things are theoretically true, but it, unless a person has invited your feedback and unless the person has come to that conclusion themselves, for me to now uh, uh, rub rub uh, vinegar in their wounds or to uh, add insult to injury someone's already hurting and now you're going to add insult to their hurt by saying something smart like that that is philosophically true but it is not compassionate and therefore it totally it totally is not the bhakti process we're not jnanis we're bhaktas and that means everything we do has to be motivated by care so if my motivation for telling you something is not really caring, we need to first examine, why, are you, why do you feel the need to say that right now? Why do you feel the need to do that right now? What's inspiring you to say that? But it's not care. I want to retaliate. That person hurt me and I want to hurt them back. Then there's no need to say it because that's not bhakti. Just decide. It may be true, but it's not caring. So delete it. <laughs> Thank you so much for that clarification and for highlighting to us, you know, why we're actually here, you know, for the, the love and devotional exchanges. And I have another question. So you were speaking about feelings being messages to us, and then you suggested that we should lean into the spiritual pain. Um, but then you also, but in the beginning, you were saying that um, often we chant in order to avoid our emotional pain and to just get enjoyment from Krishna. So can you please help us? understand how we should work through this pain we may be um, experiencing and how to take those messages as messages from our feelings yeah well, so much is about spiritual life is like paradoxical you know it's a both and it's not an either or how do you hold those hold those two ideas of leaning in and and avoiding I mean, how do you do that that's that's a, a, a that's a challenge um the best way to lead into your pain is to, first of all, name it and acknowledge, yeah, I'm feeling sad right now. I'm feeling angry right now. I'm really frustrated when he said that and I'm hurt. You know, or maybe, maybe we're feeling first anger. Uh, typically, that, that's the first feeling. Oh, I'm feeling really angry and oh, I want to say something mean back. And then uh, we have to pause and say, okay, hmm. I wonder why I'm so angry. Be curious first. Go go to the curiosity around the, the feeling. Uh, why am I so angry? Why did I overreact to that? What's underneath? And then you may get curious. Instead of beating yourself, just be curious. And then um, uh, maybe you'll notice underneath that as I, uh, you know, I'm actually really envious of that person. And I wish I could be doing what they were doing, uh, whatever. But being able to be curious and sit with the pain, and it may be that even... Even you acknowledge as you keep digging and, and exploring yourself, you may acknowledge that, oh my, this reminds me of a time when something happened and, and suddenly a flood of information comes up that you're like, oh my God, I forgot about that. And uh, so there's some grief there. And grief is the thing that we need to sit with. It doesn't feel good. You know, it just doesn't feel good. But it comes with a gift. If you sit with your grief or your sadness and uh, and chant if you can't chant or hear or just sit with it acknowledging that I'm limited I'm uh, I'm not perfect life is really really hard in the material world it can inspire us to call out for Krishna with with deep uh, uh, sincerity you know Krishna help me guide me I don't 
I don't know how to get through this and I don't know quite what I'm supposed to learn. And there may be some specific learning, but what I've come to after so many years of suffering uh, as a devotee, I realize that no matter whether you're celebrating or whether you're suffering, it's all reason to turn to Krishna. It's all good opportunity. So when we are sad or we're suffering, it can really deepen our quality of crying out. You know, it's very hard to be helpless on Krishna when you have everything you need and you're really happy. <laughs> Not to say that we should artificially suffer, but, it, you know, when we, we sit with our pain and we really get in touch with the suffering in this material world, when we chant, oh, you can chant from the deepest part of yourself. Help me, Krishna. I came to this material world not knowing what I was getting myself into. Please take me back. You know, please take me back. Uh, you know, I, I, there's nothing here to enjoy and I'm fed up. You know, I want you. I don't want anything else. So that, that's kind of how you do it. Just a great help for chanting. Thank you so much for that, that beautiful answer and just for helping us to, to realize that we should just turn to Krishna. Um, so Kamania has a, a question for us. So I'll just unmute her and then she can ask it. Hare Krishna, Mother Ramboru, thank you so much for addressing this really vital topic. Um, so my question is, uh, in the moment that a devotee is being insensitive with us, with their remarks, or if we perhaps witness another devotee having their feelings hurt by inappropriate and mistimed comments and judgments and another devotee misusing our philosophy, what would be a respectful way for us to handle it without committing Vaishnava Aparat? Are we enabling this inappropriate behavior of spiritual bypassing if we either experience it personally or if we witness it happening to another and we don't stand up to bring it to light? And how do we know when we should? Ah, oh, you're asking me a big question that only you can answer probably. Um, but. Uh, each of us is sitting in our own mind, body, spirits, and Krishna is in each of our hearts. And so I was explaining in the talk a little bit about how to, what's appropriate behavior. And um, that there's a real theory behind how do we know what's appropriate uh, to say and do at any given moment. First of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is my role in relationship to the people around me? Am I their teacher? Am I their temple president? Am I a friend? Am I their parent? That kind of thing. Uh, first identify that. What is your role? Are you, you know, the Bakhtin leader and you're in charge to advocate for new people who are maybe getting hurt by religious abuse, uh, by things like that? What is my goal here in this context? Am I, is my goal to try and offend someone? Is my goal to try to protect someone? who has been offended, uh, or to try to enlighten, bring some truth into it. That's the second thing you need to, to, to determine. And the third thing is just to read the context. What, where is the context? Am I in a public area where every, everybody's going to see and hear what I'm saying to this person that might embarrass both people? Um, so you need to determine whether this is an appropriate time, place, and circumstance to now address this issue with someone who has been hurtful. Um, it might be that you need to go to that person in a private way, you know, and, and preface that, first of all, I care about you. You know, more and more, I think it's a really helpful thing to, first of all, let people know before you offer feedback. I'm telling you this because I care about you and I care about our relationship. You know, it's hard, you're gonna, they have the professionals have this sandwich, you know, that they, you know, first you lift up the affirmations and you, then you tell them the hard news, the feedback, and then you have the, the final bottom of the sandwich, and then you, you know, flop up. That's kind of artificial, and if you're clued in, it sounds really fake. But I think, I think in the interest of bhakti, uh, if we do choose to speak up, then we need to come from a place of care. And before we do that, we need to identify why we're doing it then. It could be that we just say, oh, I'm sorry, if there's someone says that to, to you, uh, that is hurtful, and uh, I think it's appropriate to model not being defensive because that's a animal propensity: eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. 
and acknowledge that it hurt to hear you say that. The only th honest thing a person can say in this world is their experience of a thing. I can speculate about all this and add all kinds of theory to it, but the only true thing you can say to a person is how their behavior and their words affected me. Everything else you say is just defending. Just say, you know, I, I need you to know this really was hurtful to hear you say that, and I will, I will uh, sit with myself at a later time and I will consider, uh, you know, what I can learn from it. I think that's a, it may be helpful for that person to know. They may not even know they have uh, been hurtful. They may be thinking they're helping by telling you Krishna conscious philosophy in, the, in that ignorance. They may, it may be that way. I'm not sure I answered your question. What, did that make sense to you? It made a lot of sense and I'm looking for an easy answer, but it's, there is no easy answer. I understand that. I find it very hard to manage when it's um, somebody who's very close to me, a very close relationship and also senior. Um, so I will, I will think on what you, on what you said. And uh, it's, a, it's a responsibility. That, that's actually what you're saying. It's our responsibility to learn how to handle it properly. Well, There's exactly. No and if anything, anything I say to you, if you were to do it, it would be artificial because it would be something I would do. But you mm. are sitting with super souls in your heart and also praying for guidance. Show me what is the response. Um, but what I've learned in my profession and also in, in experience is that the only true thing you can say is how you how you're responding. And it could be, ouch. I mean, in professional circles, they've learned to say, oops, out, you know, I make a mistake, oops, and then ouch, <laughs> ah, oh gosh, that really hurt to hear you say that. Doesn't mean it's not true. Just, you know, I need you to know that this was really hurtful. Pain it was really painful to hear you say that. I care about us and I care about you. And um, it hurts. Mm -hmm. Doesn't, I mean, we have feelings. That's okay to hurt sometimes. <laughs> so basically acknowledge our feeling and then also say, and I'll think about what you share. Or you could, yeah. Or another, th another thing to, to, to ask the person who has perhaps intentionally or unintentionally hurt you to say, Were you, was that your intention to hurt me right now? I'm really feeling, I'm really feeling sad or disa I'm really disappointed to hear that. And I'm feeling hurt. Were you, tr you know, I'm not sure what, what your, you were trying to accomplish with your words. Often people don't have a, a real goal in their words. They're just talking. We do that too. And it's aimless. It's talking about other people. He said, she said, and talking about all kinds of, uh, what is it? Uh, name, form, qualities, pastimes, and paraphernalia of all kinds of people besides Krishna. We're so busy with all those names, form. So it can be a, an interesting question to say something you know, I'm really feeling uncomfortable with what you said or sad, if that's sad or pained and I'm confused. Oh, there's all kinds of words you could put in there. I'm, God, I'm kind of confused. Help me understand what you were trying to accomplish with your words because I'm confused by them. Can you say more about that? Um, you know, that can be there. One thing to learn, and uh, we haven't gone over this semester in our Karuna Care, so Tara may or may not know about this piece, but impact versus, uh, intention versus impact is a thing. This is sometimes people will hurt your feelings or something happens and they'll say something and they think they're being really nice to help you out uh, or they're feeling sorry for you or something. And then um, they'll say something uh, and, and uh, you'll, you'll say, uh, you'll say, oh gosh, that really hurt my feelings. They go, oh, I didn't mean to that wasn't my intention that wasn't and so but it's not really important what your intention was it's the impact and we know this from the story even of uh i think it's jiva goswami i'm not sure if that's the right person but when he was meditating absorbed in this meditation of radha and krishna and there was this moment where in the past time that he was meditating on krishna pulls a a branch of a, of a tree down and Radharani goes to smell it and he lets it go and ha 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 you know he's he's enjoying this pastime he's by himself kind of meditating and he's laughing and um, and then uh, after that his vision or his darshan of Krishna was gone it just was suddenly gone he could never get that back so he approached I think 
uh, Rupa Goswami and said, what, ha what could have happened that I had this deep meditation of Krishna and then suddenly it was gone. And he, Rupa Goswami says, you have a feast and invite everybody in the town and whoever does not show up, you probably heard that you probably offended them. And that, because when you offend another Vaishnava, you are uh, ruining your relationship with Krishna because Krishna is in their heart. So he did that. He had a feast. And there was one man who didn't come. So he went to the man and he said, Yo, I noticed you didn't come to my feast. Why not? And the man said, well, look, I have a, I have a, a lame foot. When I walk, I limp. And I was walking by your house the other day and you were laughing at me. Uh, <laughs> Jiva Goswam said, I, well, I... I don't even remember you walking by the house. I, I don't even remember. Well, the point being that even knowingly or unknowingly, if you hurt someone, uh, you, the impact can be damaging. And so that's all the more reason to be very, very careful about what we do, say. Uh, eat, same thing is if you throw your trash out in the, in the street, like in Vrindavan when I lived there, you know, people would just start dump, they would dump their trash somewhere on the road. Uh, and cows and uh, other animals would come and eat that trash. And if you had glass in your trash or if you had needles in your trash and that animal would accidentally eat it, you are tied to that karma because you absolutely, you, you recklessly threw that out, knowingly or not knowingly that it would hurt someone, you're tied to that action. So how intricate that is and how we knowingly or unknowingly may spoil our own chances of developing bhakti because of our thoughts, words, and deeds that are, are not very conscious. All the more reason to, to pray for guidance and, and wisdom and insight, how to be. I don't know what this means. I hope I hope that some of this makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for answering that so beautifully and for that wonderful pastime. It's so nice to to hear some Leela on these sessions. Um, so we have one more question here from Facebook. Sometimes it seems a way of expressing etiquette or maintaining spiritual vision to see devotees in a higher state than they may actually be to avoid offense. For example, Sometimes when I disclose my struggles or symptoms of a lower state to a devotee, they may say something like, this is just your, I mean, this is your great humility when it is actually something material. Is this bypassing? Mm. I guess it depends on how they do it. Um, generally, when we reach out and we reveal our mind, this is a loving exchange to reveal the mind in confidence and to hear someone reveal their mind. Um, and while it's, it's very flattering to be told, you know, this is your humility, um, and that may be all a person can offer you, uh, what's more, more, uh, touching to me is for, for someone to join me where I am and, um, you know, invite me to share more about it. Say more about that. That sucks, you know, or, Oh, God, that really sucks. Life can really suck sometimes. Life can really be, this place is a place of suffering. It's, it's, it, yeah. To, to somehow get in their corner and then join them where they are and, and reflect together. Tell say more about that. You know, yeah, life is sucks. And I hear your pain and I, I, I feel your pain even. Let's talk about that. Say more and invite them to share more and more deeply. If you just say, oh, that's your humility, you've, you've kind of just moved away from a relationship that could open up into something very deep if you invite the conversation. You know, uh, sometimes, of course, with patients, it's a little different because I may never see them again. And uh, sometimes when people share deeply, they are embarrassed after they've shared and they're afraid you're going to put it on Facebook or they're afraid that they've let themselves get too intimate with you and a cart connection. And, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. I said all this stuff. And, you know, it, it may come back up to the surface and wonder if they can really trust and, or whether they should have trusted you with their, their pain. But um, often when someone is, uh, has alluded to something like uh, maybe there's something going on that they're struggling with, um, if you notice there's a story behind it, if you can invite that story, 
And often people will share just a little bit to see how much you can hold. And if you're really eager to share and hear, hear their story for you to say, yeah, tell me about that. Sounds like there's a story behind that, which you said, say, say more about that. I'm, I want to hear that. Uh, most people, if you ask them or tell them, yeah, I'm, I'm here to listen to your problems. They'll go, would you like to share your problems with me? They'll go, hell no. I don't want to dump my stuff on you. Why would I do that? You know, people, people don't know, you know, that you want to uh, hear them without judging because usually people are either judged or somebody's ready to advise them what they should do to fix it. And neither one of those things are helpful. Thank you so much for that wonderful answer. I can definitely try and, and apply it in my life. <laughs> um, and yeah, that brings our session to a close. So thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day to be here with us and to share your wonderful association and wisdom. And thank you to all the, the lovely Vaishnavis who logged on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. Yeah. Really much enjoy being with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, we have one more question. Come on, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, we. Um, okay. I mean, we don't. We do not speak to her, but just our distance. Sorry. Hold on one second. Okay. One moment. Okay, cool. So uh, I think I can start. So how do we deal or interact with the devotee who took us to the temple and helped us in the beginning of our devotional life, but now is not following everything properly themselves? And I'm, I am wondering, is it offensive to associate with them? I mean, we do not speak to her, but just our distance. Uh, we are a bit distant and I feel bad. I don't want. Okay. Can you please give me some advice? Um, if you're lame, if you have no ability to walk and somebody's kind enough to carry you a certain distance, then you should be grateful they took you that distance. They may not be able, they may put you down, they carry you along and then put you down. And that's as far as it goes. You know, if they brought you to the temple, you can be very, very appreciative and grateful that they did that because they showed you the way. Now, they may put you down, but there's no reason why you can't keep going, why you can't keep walking on the road. And um, just because they are not able to keep walking on the road doesn't mean that we should still not be grateful. You owe something to someone who brings you to Krishna consciousness. To talk to someone or not talk to someone because they can't live up to a standard of bhakti? Why? Why? And the only reason you would do that is you're thinking, oh, I don't want to associate with somebody who's not good enough for me. That's kind of an arrogant thing to think that, oh, I, they're not good enough for my association because they are not practicing purely. Well, what about you offering association back to them as a reciprocation with them bringing you that far? You owe them something. Reach out. Try to, try to help and inspire or reignite without fixing. I mean, that, you're again back to caring. You know, that just because someone isn't perfect in the devotion doesn't mean we can't be caring. We, we care about pets. We care about dogs. You know, it, it, we, it's, it's a weird idea to think that, you know, uh, uh, this fear it's a it's a not again it's not bhakti this idea the whole hindu tradition is built about avoiding and dodging karma you know i've got to oh well, if i do that if i if i wink two times if i turn around if i chant this mantra i'm going to protect myself from this thing and that thing and it's a whole dodge what do you call it obstacle course the whole assumption under bhakti is that if you just love because you know Krishna's in everything and everyone. If we just love and care about people and try and connect them to their forgotten lo love of Krishna, then we are uh, actually 
reciprocating or passing it forward to the same love Krishna has given us. So it's not about rule following, although we have rules, and those rules are there to assist us in loving. Uh, I, I think I, I did a talk in, to South America a couple of days ago, and we were talking about this, how even following the four regulatory principles is based on caring. I don't eat meat fish and eggs, not because it's a rule that I'm afraid if I don't do it, I'm going to go to hell and I'm going to get bad karma. It's because I care about the animals. It's life affirming. I don't eat animals because they are different tribes. They're different races. They're different species and they have a right to carry out their life in the same way I do. So I don't eat them for that reason. It's cruel. I don't engage in uh, sub-taking alcohol, cigarettes, all because I care about not only me, but others. If I'm uh, intoxicated, then I may do or say something that hurts other people. I'm hurting myself because um, I'm not aware of myself. If I'm, my consciousness is uh, illicit sex as well, you know, exploiting someone else for their body or allowing yourself being exploited just for sense gratification is not care. It's, it's exploitation. So gambling, if Lakshmi is the goddess of fortune, then using Lakshmi in anything that is not um, part of Krishna's mission is also not caring. So we need to get over this whole idea of uh, punitive. It's kind of this idea. We get it from in Christianity. It's the same thing, you know. You know what you know. And, and often there's this focus on uh, you're not good enough. And in Lord Chaitanya's mission and message, none of us are good enough. It's pure grace. It's pure grace. Krishna is handing us purely His unconditional love, and all we have to do is take it and pass it along. That's all it is. And we do that by giving them the rope the connection to the lord in their heart and the lord in all people's hearts so that's what i want to say about that this person who has brought you to the movement and cannot follow you owe them one you know be kind reach out maybe they maybe they need help maybe they're struggling with something you can help them maybe they they have a reason why they can't do it um you know before you pass judgment find out reach out Well, thank you so much. Um, so someone just wants to know how can they hear more classes from you? Can they go anywhere? I don't know. I don't. I don't have a lot of classes. Uh, we have. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to get you. There, there, here, and there. We have an archive. Uh, one of my students is archiving things on you, uh, a YouTube channel, but it's private. I, I, I don't know how profound I am when I say things, and I'm. I'm a little nervous about letting myself loose on the world for fear of uh, what will come back to me. <laughs> but thank you for uh, the affirmation. I appreciate that, that you appreciate anything that I have to say. Um, I don't know. You can ask Tara. She knows everything. Okay. <laughs> thank you so much for, for this wonderful talk. We've, we've received a lot of different um appreciation so yeah and would love to have you you back sometime okay Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I guess I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out now with this leave button right um yeah I think um come on you yeah I just have to... Here. thank you very very much